Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is the first of a two-part video on modern telescopes. We'll discuss the advantages of modern digital techniques and how we can use modern technology to view the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We'll talk about the effects of our atmosphere on astronomy and finish off with an explanation of how radio telescopes work. In part two, we'll look at using spectral lines to analyse stars' composition and consider what we can learn using different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. When Galileo Galilei first used the telescope for astronomy, he still had to use only his eyes to see his observations. For centuries, astronomers would sketch what they saw through their telescopes. Here we can see a page from Galileo's sketchbook showing the Moon's changing appearance over time, and Giovanni Schiaparelli's sketches of Mars, including straight lines, or channels as he called them. Giovanni thought they were natural waterways, while some astronomers thought they were artificial and evidence of intelligent life on Mars. In fact, they were simply optical illusions. They don't exist. These days, while astronomers still sometimes look through telescopes and make drawings, almost all professional astronomy uses electronic sensors and computers. This gives us much more accurate and detailed images, and lets us share images with people around the world. To illustrate how this works, consider the Hubble Space Telescope. Sophisticated cameras, such as the Wide Field Camera 3, take digital images at very high resolution. Light enters the telescope and is focused onto a camera sensor, like the digital camera CCD pictured here, but much more sophisticated. The sensor converts visible light and other electromagnetic wavelengths into electronic signals, which are processed and stored as computer files. Modern astronomy uses FITS files, a specialised file format. You need specialised software to interpret these files, but when you do, the result is amazing images of space. Here is the Triangulum Galaxy, imaged by Hubble. This picture is 14,500 light years across, and appears about a third the size of the Moon in the sky. Star HBC 672 is very young, and planets are still forming around it. The planet-forming disk of gas and dust casts a shadow from the star onto a similar nearby star's planet-forming disk, in the upper right. This is nicknamed the Bat Shadow. This unusual view of the Orion Nebula is actually two images blended together. On the left we can see the nebula in visible light, and on the right, infrared. This Hubble image shows the beauty of Saturn, and its spectacular ring system. Hubble also has an ultraviolet camera. Saturn and its rings look quite different in ultraviolet. You've probably never seen Jupiter look quite like this. This image, taken up close by the spacecraft Juno, shows the turbulence of ammonia in Jupiter's upper atmosphere. Until the 20th century, astronomers only had access to visible light, a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Modern technology lets us use the whole of the spectrum. We can see objects we couldn't see before, and we can see familiar objects in literally a different light, as we just saw with Saturn. Here we can see the Crab Nebula in six different parts of the spectrum. Each image shows different details and new structures. However, our atmosphere makes many of these observations difficult. It absorbs most of the electromagnetic spectrum, preventing ground-based telescopes from observing in most wavelengths. This image shows which wavelengths get through our atmosphere. From the ground, we can only really see visible light, which gets slightly distorted by our atmosphere, and radio waves, which get straight through, even through clouds. Infrared radiation is absorbed by atmospheric water vapour. Some infrared telescopes can operate at high altitudes in dry regions, such as mountains near the equator, where there is little atmospheric water vapour above them. But for all other wavelengths, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet and most infrared wavelengths, we need telescopes in space. Even in the visible spectrum, space telescopes give better images than telescopes on the ground. Our atmosphere is great. It keeps us warm, it gives us oxygen to breathe, its pressure allows liquid water on the surface, and it shields us from harmful ultraviolet radiation and meteorite impacts. However, it spreads light across the sky. Compare these earthly shadows, lit by blue light scattered across the sky, with the almost completely black shadows on the moon. So atmospheric scattering, or refraction, distorts visible light. This limits the resolution achievable by Earth-based telescopes. The atmosphere also absorbs some light, making astronomical objects appear fainter. Cloud cover 
makes visible light astronomy temporarily impossible, and light, dust and chemical pollution, from natural and artificial sources, can obscure our vision. Here we can see a selection of the most well-known telescopes. As you can see, almost all of them are in space, particularly for wavelengths shorter than visible light on the left. Of course, all of these atmospheric problems are solved by putting our telescopes in space. Visible light images are much clearer, and we can observe the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Space-based observatories can also be pointed at the Earth. Using such telescopes, we have vastly improved our weather predictions, and we've made the satellite images used by so many of us for navigation, like Google Earth. Even more importantly, we can monitor problems and potential problems, including climate change, hurricanes and crop diseases. Satellite crop monitoring is extremely important to help us farm more sustainably. However, getting telescopes into orbit is incredibly expensive. It's also extremely hard to maintain them after launch. There have been five servicing missions to the Hubble Space Telescope at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is five more servicing missions than most space telescopes get. Finally today, we'll talk about how radio telescopes work. Radio waves from space reach the ground almost undisturbed by our atmosphere, and are detected using large metal radio telescopes. If you have satellite TV, you have a radio telescope on your roof. Satellite TV dishes use the same technology, and some amateur astronomers have actually converted their satellite dishes into functioning radio telescopes. Of course, professional radio telescopes are far larger and more sophisticated. This is the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank, 76 metres wide. Radio telescopes consist of a large metal parabolic reflector dish, which acts like the objective element of an optical telescope. The dish reflects radio waves to an antenna at the focus. The antenna is electronically linked to an amplifier to boost the signal, and then to a receiver, which records the amplified radio signals on a computer. Radio waves are very large, they have the largest wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you've watched my video on optical telescopes, you'll recall that resolution is the smallest angle at which a telescope can discern details. Resolution is better if the objective element is larger, and resolution is worse if the wavelength studied is larger. One of the most important wavelengths in radio astronomy is 21 centimetres, which we'll discuss more in a future video. To get a high resolution image, the dish must be many times the wavelength in diameter. The famous Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank, Cheshire is 76 metres across, and the largest radio telescope, FAST, in Guizhou province, China, is 500 metres across. However, very large telescopes such as FAST can't be steered or aimed at specific parts of the sky. Radio telescopes are susceptible to interference from other radio and microwave sources, such as television and mobile phone signals. They are located far from major cities, and mobile phones must be turned off. When I was studying at Jodrell Bank, there was a mysterious interference, which seemed to occur only at a certain time of day, lunchtime, and only for about two minutes. This was eventually traced to the lunchroom, where somebody had brought in a microwave oven. Even with these huge dishes, astronomical radio signals are very weak and resolution is low. But astronomers have developed a technology called interferometry, or aperture synthesis. Multiple radio telescopes spread over a large distance are linked by computers, and this forms an effective single telescope with a diameter of the distance between the most distant telescopes. The USA's Very Long Baseline Array uses 10 25-metre telescopes with an effective diameter of 8,000 kilometres. And until 2019, Russia's Spectre R used a satellite in Earth's orbit to give an effective diameter of 350,000 kilometres. That's all for today. In part two, we'll look at what we can learn using modern telescopes, including spectral lines, quasars, protostars, and more. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.